So, Seth, I'm told that we have general relativity, which uh, is the structure of space-time, which creates gravity with curvatures, and we have quantum mechanics, which is the structure of the micro-world, and these two massive theories are completely incompatible. So in order to have a real reality, we have to find quantum gravity. How are we going to do that? Well, you, you were told right, Robert, right? <laughs> Physicists in their inimitable way say that quantum mechanics and, and general relativity are like oil and water. It yeah. shows you why they're physicists <laughs> and not novelists, right? But um, <laughs> yeah, they're hard to combine. You know, you shake them up and uh, 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 leave them alone and then right. they're back again, right? You know, what, separate from each other. Uh, so indeed, this seems to be the, the primary outstanding problem, the thing that physics has failed to resolve is how do you put together our notions of gravity and specifically Einstein's theory of general relativity, which tells mm -hmm. us gravity is about geometry, mm -hmm. about distances in space and intervals in time. How do we put together Einstein's theory of general relativity and geometry together with quantum mechanics? They just don't seem to want to go together. Mm -hmm. And there have been lots of um, attempts to do that, right? In fact, uh, I should say that, that some, if you go and talk with some people, you might find some people saying they know the answer. So, for instance, I've, I've talked with string theorists who say, but of course, string theory is the answer right. to this. That's um, the, the common thought today that many, many physicists believe that string theory and one of its many, many uh, uh, structures and instances that that can deliver us the answer, but not yet. Well, it could be, right? I mean, string theory, well, who knows what string theory is? Even string theorists will tell you that they don't know what string theory is. And actually, until they actually find out what it is, I think it's a little premature to talk about these, you know, parameter-free theories. In fact, you know, if you can complete the theory in one out of seven million different ways, well, then it's a theory that has seven million different parameters. So I think it's a little early times for to say this is the theory of everything. Well, string theorists now talk about one to the 500th different vacua or different uh, structures where a string theory may exist, a, a totality of a string theory. Yeah, yeah, the, the so-called string theory landscape says, oh, well, this world that we see around us, it's only one out of 10 to the 500 different possibilities, which um, is not very much theory of everything, because in addition to your theory of everything, then you've got to specify the additional 1,500 bits need to pick out just which <laughs> place you're living in in this landscape. So, yeah, string theory could be right, though. I mean, I, I actually more object to the rhetoric of string theory. All these talk about miracles and stuff like that. They just make me slightly queasy when people talk about miracles. It, it's, you know, string theory, it's, I guess I think of it as I, I love the sin, string theory, but I hate the sinner, the way that string theorists talk about string theory. But yeah, so I actually, in my opinion, I think we should maybe step back a little bit from um, uh, quantum mechanics and gravity and, and contemplate just what it is that makes them so hard to mix before rushing in and trying to okay. quantize gravity. How like would that. you approach it? Well, so, so yeah, I have my own, my own uh, quixotic uh, theory of quantum gravity. I, I would expect nothing more, uh, n nothing normal. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I, and, and indeed, any theory of quantum gravity is at the moment kind of quixotic because to have a really good physical theory, you need to be able to compare it with observation and experiment. Yeah, well, and see. all attempts at theories of quantum gravity are very far away from that right now. So they're all going to be tilting at windmills for a while. Well, so actually, my, my theory of quantum gravity is pretty simple. Uh, I, I, I look at, and I should say, many of my best friends are string theorists <laughs> and people who do quantum gravity. I've looked at their careers for decades as they try to quantize gravity and fail. You know, nobly, they fail nobly, but they fail. And I think to myself, gee, maybe you shouldn't be doing that, right? So my approach to quantum gravity is kind of simple. So we, we're not going to quantize gravity. It, you'd be amazed how, how much easier that makes things. Hmm. All the problems that come with trying to quantize gravity go away. And then you might say, well, but heck, you're not quantizing gravity. I thought you had to have a theory of quantum right. gravity. Well, this is a completely quantum mechanical theory. It just doesn't involve taking gravity and making it quantum. So, so to, to show how this theory of non-quantum gravity can be perfectly quantum mechanical, let, let, me, let me give an example. And to do this, I'm going to take off my watch here. This is a, don't worry, it's the only thing I'm going to take <laughs> off. Uh, so, so how did Einstein describe gravity, his notion of gravity as being curved space? He imagined that you had a, a bunch of clocks flying through space. Mm -hmm. And these clocks were sending signals to other clocks. And you record when the signal departs from this clock, you know, at which tick of this clock does the signal depart. 
And then this other clock, you record at which tick of this clock does this signal arrive. Right? And then you say, oh, OK, it took that signal three seconds to get here. So that means we're three times the speed of light meters apart, right. you know, some, some uh, 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 hundred million meters or may, uh, maybe billion meters yeah. apart, right? So you measure distance by measuring time. Now, so then what does it mean to quantize space and time? Well, when someone like a string theorist wants to quantize space and time, they say, oh, this interval of space is actually quantum mechanical. It's something that's out there, and it has to wiggling up and down and at some burbling yeah, at some right. incredibly tiny scale. And similarly, this interval of time is out there and burbling at this little tiny right. scale. But if you look at what happens when you try to make space and time quantum mechanical, that's where the trouble arises. Because in quantum mechanics, Space and time are not things that you can actually measure. So time is not what's called an observable in quantum mechanics. You can't observe it. Yeah. And you might say, well, what the heck? I mean, what's, this, what's this measuring? Well, yeah. You've got a yeah. clock right there. It's yeah. measuring time. Well, <clears throat> it's actually not measuring time in the same way as we would you know, measure the electromagnetic field you know, or measure weight or something like that, or measure calories, right? yeah. measure energy. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> uh, if you go to the National Institute of Standards and Technology and you tell them, you make the mistake of complimenting on how well their clocks measure time, mm -hmm. which I, I, made, yeah. I made this mistake, right? <laughs> so they will say to you, our clocks don't measure time, yeah. which I say, what, yeah. what? They say, yeah, they are no, time, time, yeah, time <laughs> is defined to be what our clocks are ticking out, right? right, right. So the clock defines time, all right? Now, all my theory, my quixotic theory of quantum gravity do, or non-quantum gravity does, mm -hmm. my quantum mechanical theory of gravity that's not quantized is to take that seriously. What is time? It's something that a clock ticks out. So we shouldn't be quantizing space, intervals of space and intervals of time. They're not things that we can actually quantize. What we should quantize is clocks. We should quantize the oh. clocks. And we should quantize the signals, the particles of light that we send uh -huh. from one place to another in order to measure those distances. Because it's those observables, the clock observables, the observable, you know, at which tick of this clock did this signal arrive? That's what actually defines what we call an interval in space or an interval in time. What would be the implications of that? Well, so that's, this is where the fun stuff comes in. Because, in fact, first of all, this makes quantizing gravity a lot easier. Uh -huh. And I mean a lot easier. Why? Because we actually know how to quantize clocks. We know how to quantize signals. You know, clocks, atomic clocks are made up of atoms. Sure. That's what quantum mechanics describes. Sure. It describes how atoms sure. behave. Sure. So for instance, if we take those atomic clocks at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and we can, we can describe them very accurately quantum mechanically, we know exactly how they give little quantum burbles and quantum hiccups, right? And similarly, the light you know, these signals, these photons that are emitted by the clocks, we know how to quantize light. Sure. That's what Einstein got his right. Nobel Prize right. for, right? You know, the photoelectric effect. Light is quantum mechanical, right? So we know how to quantize light, and we know exactly how photons burble and, and wiggle and exhibit little quantum hiccups as they move from one place to another. So let's see what implication that has for space and time. So space and time, remember, we're defining space-time geometry by GPS, the Global Positioning hmm. System, clocks in space, sending each other signals. It was Einstein's idea. Now it's a beautiful right. reality, right? You yeah. know, one of the most beautiful yeah. engineering systems <laughs> in the world. I'm sorry, as a professor of mechanical engineering, I, I regard beauty as something that works, right? This right. is why I'll have trouble with string theory. Again, right? <laughs> Elegant, not unless it works, okay? <clears throat> All right, so let's quantize GPS. How do we quantize GPS? And what happens when we do? Well, what we see is, in fact, the thing we call space and time exhibits these quantum verbals. Why? Because there's little quantum accidents about when the signal gets emitted by this clock. You know, at which tick of this clock was the signal emitted? At which tick of this other clock was the signal absorbed? Uh -huh. there, those are uncertain. You right, know, right, from the right. Heisenberg uncertainty sure, principle, sure. it's uncertain when it happens. And those little verbals are indistinguishable from verbals in the actual fabric of space and time. Yeah. So, we're not quantizing gravity. We're not quantizing distance and time directly. We're quantizing clocks and signals. But the effect of quantizing clocks and signals means that gravity is, in fact, very quantum mechanical. Because the very notion of a distance is referred to a quantum mechanical object. Mm. So we actually get something that people would dearly like to have from a theory of quantum gravity. Like a theory of, for instance, how does space and time fluctuate? 
Uh, but we get it without quantizing gravity. Instead, we get it by quantizing GPS. And once you quantize GPS, hey, it's already quantum. We know what a <laughs> how to quantize an atomic clock and a photon. And then that makes one's life much, much, much easier.